We are going to talk today about network neutrality. You heard Vince Cerf give an overview of that issue from his perspective. I think what we're going to try to do here today is drill down a little bit more. <clears throat> I can tell you that in my past life, my, I'm Jonathan Krim, by the way. I am currently Director of Strategic Initiatives at WashingtonPost.com. Uh, but until very recently, I spent four and a half years as a reporter for the Post covering technology policy issues. And I can tell you that there was no issue that I came across in that time that I found more intriguing and potentially more important than network neutrality. And I, I believe we are on the precipice of some very important decisions that will define in many ways the future of the Internet and how our economy grows. Um, we're going to drill down on this issue beyond what Vince Cerf talked about, and I'm joined by a very distinguished group. Uh, on the far left is Jerry Waldron, who is an attorney who represents a number of content companies who are very interested in making sure that network neutrality is preserved. Next to him is Link Hoeing, who is uh, Vice President for Internet and Technology Policy at Verizon. Next to him is Bennett Ross, who is General Counsel of uh, Bell South Corporation here in D.C. Dr. Mark Cooper is Director of Research at the Consumer Federation of America. And uh, Danny Weitzner is um, with the World Wide Web Consortium. And um, what I want to do is take just a few seconds to put this in context, and then we're going to have very brief statements from the panelists, and then we're going to open it up. We're going to do a little free-for-all thing, and hopefully then uh, involve many of you as we can in the 45 minutes that we have. Um, I was talking with the VC recently about uh, what kinds of interesting companies they are investing in. And she told me about one which is developing a 21st century jukebox. And actually, I believe the product is now on the market. This is a jukebox for bars and restaurants, which, as you might imagine, doesn't rely solely on the records that are inside the box as the choices that you have, but is connected to the Internet so that it has access to tens of thousands of uh, legally downloaded songs, which the user, when they drop their coins in, um, would pay for. I thought that was pretty cool, but she said, there's one other interesting wrinkle to this. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, if you walk up to the jukebox and you put your dollar in and you choose your song, it goes into the queue. But if you wa then walk up to the jukebox and put a dollar fifty in, your choice will go to the head of the queue. And so on and so on and so on. So basically, the more you pay, the more priority your song will get in playing on that jukebox. And in many ways, that I think is a proper analogy for what can happen with packet prioritization on the Internet. Um, it's very important, I think, to understand we are not talking about outright blocking. There's not a person sitting at this, on this rostrum that believes that any Internet provider should be able to block other content. But what we are talking about is the capacity to identify the digital stream and prioritize that stream. And that does have a significant effect on performance. Now, if you put that in the context of some of the other basic utilities that we are used to, such as the electrical grid, you could imagine a scenario where Sony would pay for better performance for any appliance that you plug into the wall than Panasonic. Uh, the gas company could do the same thing with any appliance that uses gas. If you buy uh, you know, one company's furnace, you'll get more gas, better heat, whatever, than another company's furnace. And that is essentially what is being talked about by some of the um, ISPs in the marketplace for the Internet. Now, their, um, their view is that they are more than just the pipe provider. They are also application providers. And they want to compete with other applications providers that are using their networks. And so, in their minds, why shouldn't they be able to make use of their networks in order to provide better service for their applications than the other application providers? So that's, that's this issue in a nutshell. And the question is, is government intervention necessary, as, as I think Dr. Cerf was suggesting, or at least some means of not allowing that model to occur, or is the marketplace, again, the most efficient way to handle this issue? So I'm going to ask each of these panelists 
to talk for no more than 30 to 45 seconds and just briefly state where they are on this issue. I know, I know. But, and then we're going to open it up. So, Danny, I'm going to start with you and just move down the table. So if I take a whole five minutes, then we Yeah, right. Thank you. Go ahead. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, well, I, I come at this issue from a, a relatively simplistic uh, view. I, I'm interested in how the web works, and I'm interested in the web being able to continue to work. Uh, the web, of all the various applications on the Internet, does one relatively unique thing. It allows leading up information from one place to another. Uh, it allows anyone who wants to write a web page uh, uh, to include on that web page information from other places on the web. Uh, you may have to get copyright permission uh, from the person who owns that information uh, if you want to actually reproduce it, but you don't have to get their permission to link to it, and you certainly don't have to go and talk to their ISP to figure out whether anyone who looks at your web page is going to be able to get the content that you link to, that you meant them to see. So the web is, is, is in technical terms, a many-to-many -many medium. And, and I would suggest of all the, the Internet applications that we're used to, it's, it's, it's one of the ones that's sort of unique in that way. Um, chat rooms have a many-to-many -many character. But the web really has succeeded because it's able to function as an information aggregation point, And anyone can aggregate any information. Uh, again, copyright issues uh, put, put aside for the moment. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that the critical question for, for this whole debate is uh, are networks going to begin to function in a way that they impede the operation of the World Wide Web? If they don't, then I don't need to come back to this panel. If they do, then, then I would have a real concern and I think we should all have a, a, a real concern because the web, I can guarantee you, is not the only many-to-many -many application on the Internet and we're only just beginning to see, in fact, the real uh, social and economic and cultural value of this many-to-many -many nature of the web. The blogs, which, which, which exist today, for uh, sometimes to the, the bane of, of, of many politicians, only exist because of this many-to-many -many feature, and we should be able to preserve that, that unique feature uh, of, of the web as this debate goes forward. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Non-discriminatory access to the means of transportation and communication are the cornerstone of an open economy and a democratic society. They came to this nation with the pilgrims under English common law. They were extended and turned into common carriage in the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 when the railroads refused to abide by that principle. They were extended to the telephone companies in 1910 in the Mann-Elkins Act, memorialized in the Communications Act of 1934, and when the issue of data transmission came up before the FCC, the computer inquiries preserved an open and non-discriminatory means of communications that created the environment in which the Internet succeeded. There is no doubt that public policy is necessary to preserve this fundamental principle, which was mistakenly overturned administratively by the Federal Communications Commission in the cable modem proceeding and later the DSL order. If you allow network operators to discriminate in terms of who can afford to pay for the service, charging the service providers, they will gain an unfair competitive advantage and gain an unfair political voice. Speech will be restricted to people who are willing, as companies, to buy the speed of speech, neither as a matter of economic principle nor as a matter of political principles is this kind of discrimination acceptable. Thank you. Bennett. I think uh, Mark framed the issue exactly the right way. Mark wants to look backward. Bell South wants to look forward. What Bell South is talking about in the context of net neutrality is a bigger, better, faster internet, the internet of the future. We see there are really two overarching principles or questions that have to be addressed. I think Dr. Cerf identified them correctly. Namely, is this some, an area in which the government should regulate? Everybody would agree that the internet has enjoyed the, exper enjoyed the success that it has as a result of the government's hands off the internet policy. Some in this room and some outside in the media would now want the government to change that to hands all over the internet. But we don't think that's a good idea. The second overarching principle or question is if the government's going to regulate, what should those regulations look like? Should it be the historical common carriage uh, notion which doesn't make any sense on a shared facility? And should the rules be written in such a way so restrictively 
that network providers can't innovate, cannot offer any differentiated services, cannot bring the benefits of a bigger, better, faster Internet to consumers. The question is, are consumers going to benefit from net neutrality legislation? And Bell South believes the answer to that is no, and they certainly won't benefit from narrowly restrictive net neutrality rules. Thank you. Link. I'm a father of uh, three daughters who have safely gotten through uh, life to college, so I'm a perennial optimist. And, uh, and I really do want to focus on the optimistic because I think a lot of good things have been happening in the last several years. Part of it was because of government policy changes that I think did encourage a lot of good investment and uh, competition. Part of it was because of the changes in the technology, which actually have made convergence a reality more and more. Uh, we talked about it for years. It's happening now. And part of it was because of competition, frankly, between a lot of the network players and because application providers and others have taken advantage of increasing amounts of houses that are on broadband to build applications that drive broadband usage. So we're getting into a virtuous cycle, which I think is fantastic. I think it's good for Americans. I think all of us in the industry, certainly Verizon, recognizes that having a uh, full Internet connectivity as one of the services that we offer on the BIOS fiber pipes that we're deploying is an incredibly important thing. Consumers want it. They demand it. We're delivering it. And we have committed to network what are called the net neutrality or connectivity principles uh, in part because we also recognize that it's important to state publicly that we, in fact, do support the idea of having full Internet connectivity as one of the services we offer on these pipes as we deploy them. Jerry. I guess I get the last word. Um, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of whether we think government or there is a role for government to preserve the Internet, we think the answer to that is yes. Um, as Dr. Cerf testified yesterday, the Internet as a catalyst of innovation is at risk if the network operators for the first time get to interject themselves in to be the gatekeeper between the consumer and content. Um, with all due respect, the fact is that the Internet was born and grew up with the government role of non-discrimination that is at the core of the communication system for the last at least 40 years. We think that is a, a notion, it is, it is the, the notion of non-discrimination and the notion that consumers can get to the content that they want is at the heart of the Internet. The second point is that the Internet, again to use Dr. Serve's testimony, is about innovation without permission. Larry Page did not have to go ask permission when he decided to set up Google. Jeff Bezos did not have to go and ask permission. But if you wanted to start a cable channel today, you would actually have to go to Comcast and knock on their door and say, is it okay to get on? We don't think that the Internet should evolve to the point, if it's, if it's better and faster, we don't think the Internet should evolve to the point where we have to go and knock on Bell South's door or knock on Verizon's door in order to provide content. We think it's great that they're getting into the content business. Good luck to them. Let's compete with them. We don't think that they should then get to decide who wins and loses. The, the third point is that um, the, the uh, network operators, including the telephone companies, have spent billions of dollars to upgrade their plants, have, as have the cable networks. And that is a figure you hear a lot. The truth is that the Internet content companies also have spent billions of dollars investing in content, billions of dollars investing in their infrastructure. So as you worry about broadband policy, as you worry about broadband penetration, you should worry about the investment not just by the pipe owners, but the investment at the end of the network. Because that's actually why consumers buy broadband service. Not because they like a fast pipe, but because they like the content that is at the end of the, uh, end of the pipe. Jerry, so that's, if I could... I'll stop. Stop you there. Um, Link, let me go back to you then. In, in your short talk, you mentioned Verizon's commitment to network neutrality principles. Um, as I read reports of um, one of your executives yesterday, uh, you guys have now very publicly joined in uh, the construct laid out first by Ed Whitaker and then by Bill, S Bill Smith of Bell South of essentially the ability of network operators to charge uh, pay for performance on your networks. So given that, what is it that network neutrality means to Verizon in that, in that construct? Our policy is, as I said, um, it is that we support the network neutrality connectivity principles. And the four principles state very clearly, 
uh, that, number one, consumers should be able to use the Internet connection to go where they want to on the net, but they ought to be able to attach any device and they ought to be able to run any application. Uh, that's what we're committed to. So, so that does not exclude the possibility of charging for preferred performance of applications? I think all this is hypothetical. I don't know how the market's going to evolve, so I don't think that's worth commenting because I don't know how these things will work out. Okay. Well, Bennett, your CTO has said very clearly that's exactly how he sees the world developing. So in that situation, why don't you talk a little bit more about why that is better for consumers? Bell South is not talking about imposing a toll or unilaterally assessing charges on anybody to use the Internet. What Bell South is talking about is the ability and having the flexibility to enter into commercial arrangements by which a, a, an Internet service company may want to purchase network management services from Bell South. We manage networks. We've been doing it for 100 years. If a, if a Internet service company believes that they can offer something extra to the consumer and there's value in us having performing a function to deliver higher quality of service, then we should be able to do that. Uh, so, I, so let me just ask. Sure. Uh, th th I presume that means, and I'm, I'm saying this because I was the one asking Bill Smith these questions mm -hmm. at the time, um, that means that Google could come to you and say, we want to be the fastest search engine on your network, and we will pay for that privilege. And, and you want the ability to be able to do that. Absolutely. I, I think the idea that Google would come to us to ask us for that is probably unlikely. Google is a $120 billion company. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, they have certainly the resources to, to deploy their own network facilities. It probably would obviate the need for them to purchase network management resources from us. But we do think that, it, that it's likely that maybe a smaller search engine that seeks to compete against Google may want to differentiate itself from Google by having those kinds of value-added services. As Link said, I mean, a lot of this is hypothetical because we are talking about the future, and it's impossible to predict how all of this was going to play out. But as we Can learned... I would, would you be willing to uh, commit to sell that capability to anybody who came and knocked on your door and asked for it? We would be willing to entertain whatever, just as any business, if we have, if we have something to sell, we're going to sell it. What, what we're not willing to do is enter, in, enter into this, this, this antiquated common carriage regime that everybody has to be treated exactly the same, and you can't differentiate your service in any way. That doesn't work on a shared facility like a broadband pipe, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't Danny work first. in the future. Danny first. So I think there's a trick in your question, John, and the trick is that there's an assumption that you can somehow sell Google or, or the competitor to Google access uh, in a way that they can be faster than anyone else without making everyone else slower. I, I, I don't think that there's anything that, that, that violates uh, uh, the notion of how the Internet works to say someone can, can get their packets delivered more expeditiously. But if what that means is that, is that Bell Souths or Verizon's part of the Internet all of a sudden delivers certain packets uh, to the exclusion of other packets or puts those other packets at the, at the back of the list and says, well, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the service that I thought I was going to be able to offer to people who happen to be Bell South customers or happen to be Verizon customers uh, is, 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 is degraded, then, then what's being sold is, is really a kind of a scarcity that's never been a part of the Internet. I've never had to think about that. No one who makes a website has ever had to think about the fact that certain people, uh, because of who their ISPs are, will receive it. Uh, uh, in, a, in, in a less advantageous way. Mark? Let me make it clear that I don't have any problem with differentiation. I have a problem with discrimination. By differentiation, I mean sell the customer a 10 megabit service. They do that today. They can sell me DSL, they sell me dial up. But anything that fits under that 10 megabit service has to be allowed to go. They cannot then turn around to the, the service provider and say, hey, look, Cooper bought 10 megabits, but you know what? You can't go there because I made a deal with someone else so that only the 10 megabit service works for him. So I believe in differentiation, but not discrimination. And let me give you a, a prediction about what will happen if you let him make that deal with a particular service provider. They will favor their own service by either not paying it for themselves, gaining a competitive advantage, or they will favor their service by giving themselves speed. They will discriminate against anyone else who does not pay the rate 
that they have extracted. They will give their affiliates and friends advantages and disadvantage those people who haven't capitulated to them. They will use the information about who is selling services to the customer to gain a competitive advantage. Now, how do I know that they will do this? Because they have just spent the last 10 years doing that to the CLEX. The competitive local exchange carriers were miserably abused by their, those very business practices. That is the way they do business. This is not a hypothetical. This is the history that we had. The, the, they want to legitimate that practice going forward. These are the same practices that John D. Rockefeller used on the railroad industry 100 years ago. So the past and the future look exactly right. And some good principles, I was accused of looking backwards. Well, some principles, like democracy, like openness, are actually old principles, and they ought to apply to the future. Link, do you want to respond to that real quick? Well, let me, let me follow up then um, and put it in the context of a business that I think is not hypothetical at all, uh, and that is um, Internet telephony. Um, that is a business, obviously, that your industry and the cable industry is entering quite rapidly and is already there. And there are existing competitors that are not network, network operators. Um, in that context, packet prioritization is absolutely essential to the quality of the call. I know this because I'm a, a, a customer of, of one of the alternative VoIP providers. And I will tell you that, that at the moment, uh, the voice quality is, is extremely erratic. Um, now, I am fully expecting, and I've gotten the first one already, um, the barrage of advertisements and pitches from the network operators and in my case, I have one, a choice of two, so I'm lucky, um, offering their VoIP services and assuring the highest quality on the Internet because it's their voice service. So doesn't that speak exactly to sort of Mark and Danny's point? No. Uh, as I said earlier, as long as we are making available, and as I said, the market's going to drive us to do it, and so is competition a broadband pipe the consumer can use to do what they want to on the internet. And in our case, the speeds with files, our fiber network, are up to 30 megs. I don't think you're going to have a problem running that service. Second, uh, we also are an applications provider. We also sell VoiceWing, which is a VOIP service. Right. We're selling it in 40 states right now. So we have an incentive. And that's the beauty of the internet. I mean, we're also playing in other parts of the internet. And we have an incentive to want to see the VOIP service work well on other people's broadband networks. So, you know, the notion that we would have incentives to want to do uh, the kinds of things that Mark has been talking about, because we have other interests too, is, I think, wrong. So, in other words, that, that's an interesting point, and I'll get back to you, Danny. But you, what you're saying is that on, on all of Verizon's networks, you don't have an incentive to prioritize voice wing above Vonage, let's just say, because, because let me just finish, okay. because you are also trying to sell voice wing on Bennett's networks and other networks, and you wouldn't want them to do that to you. I'm not commenting on prioritization at all. I'm just saying that VOIP service that we're selling on other networks, we want to run as well as it does on our broadband network. So for that reason, we want to make it, we don't think the idea that companies will want to degrade service, that's different than prioritization, degrade service, I don't think that's true. You know, I think we, we find ourselves kind of slipping into uh, uh, a notion of regulation based on scarcity that we're used to in broadcast networks, we're used to in, in, in telephone networks where you've got to, uh, you know, allocate facilities and switches and, and, and lines and things like that. To me, one of the really interesting things at the Senate uh, hearing yesterday was the testimony from the Internet 2 uh, crew who said that after a number of years of experimenting with, with packet prioritization in order to solve this, this voice over IP problem, in order to solve video timing problems, what they discovered was that it was actually cheaper and more efficient as an engineering matter to just add more bandwidth. And, and so it is far from, from clear that the thing to do is to create scarcity and, 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 then, and then saddle ourselves with all these, these regulatory problems. It's far from clear that that's the right answer. I think anyone who claims they know that's the answer simply doesn't have the engineering to back it up. And, there's, and I'm not going to say anyone's claiming that here, but, but, but the assumption when, when, when we kind of try to shove the Internet into a telecommunications regulation model is that we have to somehow allocate 
scarce goods. Well, the Internet allocates scarce goods differently, and it does not do it uh, by constraining bandwidth at the ends. Jerry, do you want to talk about that particular point? Well, we, I mean, we do think that it is important that whatever the network is designed, and, and you know, frankly, you know, these guys do design networks for a living, um, and we're saying whatever design they pick, we think the network should be maximized in order to enable consumers to, to get there. We do worry that suddenly quality of service is being treated as a good that they either decide to give you or don't decide to give you. They decide to give to their content and not to somebody else's content. And that we think that, frankly, the Internet has grown up around the value of everybody gets the capability of the network. It's not something that is ladled out after you go and ask permission. And that is the innovation without permission notion of it. Um, we, what we're hearing, and, and what is a cause for concern, is that the network operators treat quality of service as something that they say yes or no when you come and knock on their door. And that is a, whether it's a scarcity argument or whether it's something else, I'm going to put a label on it. But that seems to be the notion that we're now hearing. And that is a foreign concept to, to, to the Internet. And frankly, it's a foreign concept to those companies that invest in the content that drives the, the penetration. There's, there's been... Um, can, I, can I just interject yeah, something? Sure. I want to debunk the notion that, that, that Bell South is trying to create scarcity. I mean, we, we're rolling out faster and faster broadband services. We just rolled out a six meg service. We just reduced prices for our, uh, for our lower speed broadband DSL. The idea, though, that somehow, and I believe the gentleman who testified yesterday said that we ought to have 100 megabits available by six years and a gigabit ten years after that. My only question is this. Who's going to pay for it? Right now, we've got customers who won't pay $24 for 256 kilobit of DSL, which is our, what we call DSL Lite. How are you going to convince those customers to pay whatever 100 megabits are going to cost, which can be considerably more than $24? The, the only way they're going to do that is to, is to feel as if they're getting something for value, something more than they're getting today which is why we're talking about the future, talking about trying to come up with innovative services and applications that customers will say, hey, wait a minute, it is worth me paying money to get broadband. But that's not really what this is about, right? You, you're not the only one developing those services. The issue is you believe you should be able to do that so that you can invest in your network to make it faster over time. Right? right. Isn't, the, that, isn't that fair? The, the idea is that if you, don't, if, you, if you believe, which Bell South does, that you cannot expect to recover the entire cost of the next generation of broadband network from the end user customer solely in the way of broadband access charge, broadband internet access charges, then you have to look for other revenue streams. And the other revenue streams that we're looking at are commercial arrangements where we can provide value added services to the companies who are willing to pay for it. It's not, it, it is not changing anything that the customer is getting today except to give the customer something that they don't have today, which is another option in the way of a, a quality of service. Mark, real quick, and then I want to drill down a little more. You answered the question, why anybody in his right mind would pay $96 a month for a megabit of service is quite clear. This is outrageous. You have overpriced that access. You can't deliver applications in that service anyway. So you have forgotten the fundamental lesson of the Internet, right? Make functionality available on a network charge the public for it, and let the innovators develop the services that drive the demand. That's how we got here, because the real innovators who want to think about this stuff need access to the public. You put the functionality out there, and if you doubt that the Googles and the next Googles and all of those distributed innovators will not think of neat things for the public to want to buy, you have missed the lesson of the last 30 years. This is the model. Charge me for the functionality. Give me tiers and layers of service and let people innovate to those services. Um, and they will do a fine job. It's not the phone companies that have, who have been allowed to do this. You haven't innovated anything. You didn't develop any of these services that you now want to charge for. Okay, let's, let's, not, let's, time out, time out. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to devolve into the whole broadband access debate, which is interesting but separate. Um, I, actually, I'm going to come to the I'm going to come to the uh, to the rescue of my bell friends here. But no, what, what I do want to say is that there is a notion 
that the Bells, you know, I'm old enough to remember the content versus conduit wars of the, uh, of the 1980s where the Bells couldn't get into that business. That, that war is over. The Bells can get into the content business. They, as, as, as Ben said, they're, they're going to collect money from, from the customers and we expect them to also be in the applications and content business and try to sell content and applications to customers on VoIP and IPTV and other things. That's great. I, I mean, we, we actually, you know, welcome to, to the game. It's whether others should be able to do that as well. And, and as opposed to turning and saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a gatekeeper on the backside and decide what content so, goes in. So let, let's, let's imagine... Because I mean, these I've guys. I, I, I'm also with with Jerry in, in coming to, to the defense of the network operators. I mean, providing uh, you know a couple uh, uh, kilobits or a half a megabit a second uh, internet access for tens of millions of people around the country is a very serious engineering challenge. And these companies have spent a lot of money and are doing it, and have in fact because of that, we see all kinds of new services on the web. File sharing services. You know, well, some people are after you guys for making it so easy to do that, right? So, so, so the network operators have a, a clear and critical role in making innovation happen. And, and I, uh, in, in, in my optimistic mode with, with Link, I'll say that I, I think that um, maybe we'll all get really lucky here. Cooler heads will prevail, and, and the network operators will realize that if they charge uh, customers out of the box, and if, if, they, if they freeze out potential uh, innovators, that they, in fact, won't have anything to sell. That's, that's got to be an important motivation here. I hope uh, uh, that, that and, and I think everything that's happened in the Internet access space has indicated that, that, that the network I, operators I, have followed that lead. I want to move to is, some, that change? I want to move to some policy specifics. If we imagine a world in which something happens here in order to in the, in the view of proponents, assure uh, open networks. Um, would, Link, you and Bennett, would you, could you see a world in which there is a baseline quality of service slash speed slash whatever you call it that any um, application provider using your network is entitled to? And above and beyond that, you are able to charge whatever commercial agreement you can read, as you, as you said. Now, obviously, that begs a very big question of what that baseline number is. But just in a, in a hypothetical sense, is that a policy framework that, that might be workable in your view? Uh, we've been doing um, and deploying DSL. In fact, I was in the first trials at Bell Atlantic had with DSL in 1993, and ironically enough, it was for video. We had a video on demand trial using DSL. And to Mark's point about innovation, we actually helped move in DSL on those trials. It was the wrong uh, application. It turned out the internet was what DSL ought to be used for, but, but that's part of that's the nature of experimentation and investment. But um, so we've been doing DSL actively since 1998, and I hesitate to get into any hypotheticals. That's one of the reasons we're in the kind of debates we're in today, because people presume to understand where this is going. I don't really uh, know how much more is going to happen on broadband, but I'm very optimistic it's going to continue to increase in speed and capability. I, I think that's going to happen. I also think that over time, we're going to find that a lot of these debates are going to be worked out, because I think companies will find ways to work together. Because one of the nature, things about the Internet that is, I think, a real strength of it and we see it certainly, is that there's a lot of networks and a lot of players and a lot of cooperation that's necessary to get my customers' packets to where they want it and back. And you can't do that unless you work with companies, as well as compete. Both happen on the Internet. I agree with what Link said, but I think the only thing I'd add is that I think what you described is basically the model we have now, which is you've got your basic best efforts, which is what the public Internet is. You go to a website, you may get variable downstream download speeds, it depends on what the internet congestion is like on any given day, it depends on what the server situation is. What we're talking about is not changing that at all. You'll get the best efforts you get today, you'll get it tomorrow. What we're talking about, however, is giving customers the option and companies the option to have something better than best efforts, which is some quality of service. But I think that that doesn't exist today. I mean, you would acknowledge that for the most part, well, That's not exist. a model. That, that, well, that part of it does not exist today. Yahoo just announced, AOL just announced uh, a week ago that they're going to provide priority email service, quality of service, you have to pay for it, you get your traditional best efforts email delivery, 
but you can get a little something extra for for for, for non-filtering, which is different than packet prioritization. It, it's the, it is it, you're correct. It, technically, it's different, but the concept is absolutely the same, which is you have a baseline best efforts option and you have a quality of service option. There's there's going to Mark's point about innovation on the internet. He's absolutely correct. We, the, Bell, the Bell South has not been the the inventing search engines and doing the things that, that Google and the like have had. But that doesn't mean we can't play a role in innovation, should have the opportunity to, to partner with companies that want to innovate at the edge of the network. And all we're talking about is not having the, a law written that prevents us from doing that. Let me just, before I get to Mark, I, will, I promise I will get to you, but I want to do one quick follow-up for you guys on this point. In a world where what you're talking about happens, would you see any disclosure obligations on the part of the ISP to customers who are choosing their broadband providers to know whether or not your ISP, your network, has certain agreements with certain apps that I might be interested in using so that I would know that I could expect one level of service if I went with the cable operator, let's just say, and another level of service if I went with uh, the telephone operator? Would there be a disclosure obligation on the part of the ISP to disclose the very commercial agreements that you're talking about so that I, as the end user, understand before I sign up with you that I'm going to get a quality of service for some of the applications that I like? Under the connectivity principles, as they were first espoused and as they've been repeatedly uh, referenced since then, there is a, a clause that talks about the consumer being informed about any limitations that apply to their service. So I don't know if... I, you, don't, you don't consider this a limitation. You consider no, this an enhancement. But there are service issues that, would, might, that you'd have to know about as a consumer. I, don't, I think this is actually outside of a broadband connection you're talking about. In other words, the full connectivity internet that we're talk, connection we're talking about is one thing. You're talking about special services that might be on the rest of the pipe that you're No, offering. no. I'm, I'm saying that I'm, let's just say, hypothetically, a Vonage customer. And it's going to be important for me to know that Vonage has paid you, Verizon, something wow. to assure a higher level of quality of service than they have to the cable operator when I decide which broadband provider. I, I'm, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals, but I can just say that I would think the companies that are getting these services will have every incentive to tell people what they're offering. I mean, what Vonage, <laughs> That's the market. If Vonage believes there's value added in paying Bell South to, prefer, to perform network management services, presumably they're going to advertise that fact to their customers. You know, boy, this is going to be really great. You're going to get really great service and, you know, buy our service. So the answer is there's no need for a disclosure requirement in your view? Well, there, we believe it's absolutely, as Link said, we're committed to making sure our customers understand what they're buying in the way of a DSL connection, what it entails, what capacity it, it, that they will get, what they will get from us. If that customer decides to use that broadband to go to a particular website with whom we have a commercial agreement, my own view, and I, I don't know we've ever talked about this as a company, is that that disclosure would probably be handled by the Internet company to whom the customers go with. Mark, wait, Mark, I promise Mark for I want to make a point about the, the offering of, of uh, filtered email or whatever. And Vince Cerf made this point. If I don't like that email offering, I have at least 50 choices, maybe 500 choices. When it comes to last mile connectivity, speed internet, if I'm lucky, I've got two. Maybe I've got two and a half. All these other things people keep dreaming about aren't there. And so I don't have enough competition to discipline their ability to leverage that. that, that. And it's a fundamental difference. And I trust law fully recognizes that little guys get to do things and big guys can't because they have market power. There is simply not enough choice. There's an expression in economics, four is few and six is many. We're talking about two. Two is simply not enough for me to accept their incentives to compete and say, well, the marketplace will make me do this. The market, well, the answer is that frequently the incentive of a person with market power is to create artificial scarcity and thereby raising prices. So we have a simple solution. And we go back to it, make network functionality available, charge for it on a non-discriminatory basis, and watch the Internet people fill those pipes up. That's the way to make this work. Danny, first, and then Jerry. about the prioritization and quality of service issue. The, the one thing I could say about, about quality of service is that it has nothing to do with the way the Internet operates today. 
it's totally antithetical to the best efforts internet. And, and there are arguments that a lot of people think that we need some kind of quality of service uh, approach for the internet as a whole. And I think then the critical question is whether that quality of service is, is available on some kind of open basis to anyone who, who wants to use it. When I look at, 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 because right now, today, we see all kinds of mechanisms, some of which I assume the, the, the network carriers will want to offer for, for providing quality of service. We see caching services. We see companies like Akamai that, that, that offer effective quality of service uh, enhancements that are available to any content provider, any web website operator who wants to use them. That's the way the internet has worked. When we start talking about quality of service mechanisms that are only available to people who can make the right deal with the right ISP, we're just talking about a totally different environment. It's not quite the, the environment we have in cable, but it looks to me an awful lot closer to that uh, than to the internet. And I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but I think we should be very careful before we say this is the Internet, because this is not the Internet that any of us know. It's a totally different uh, uh, kind of sure. environment. I love Danny, but I'm going to say I, we do think something is seriously wrong if the Internet turns into the cable model. And, and, so, into it, uh, and, and so, and so we, we sort of do see that. And, and, and the question is sort of who gets to decide. The carriers absolutely are, are entitled to, to sort of make money to the extent that they are offering additional functionality in that regard. But who gets to, to decide? I mean, the, the, the suggestion was at the, at the company's option. Well, that's one choice, meaning the content provider's option. But if it is at the network operator's option, then that is the cable model all, all over again. And so the, the choice question is, is a fundamental one. And as, as Danny points out, heretofore, the Internet has been innovation without permission where, where the people at the end decide, gee, if I want to open up a web page, I know I will get on. And if I want to go to Akama and buy uh, caching, fine, I can do that. I get to decide as opposed to somebody else deciding. Look, Dr. Surf talked about, I think he made a very interesting point, which was that we wouldn't be having this conversation if the, pa the pipe was fat enough. As we, we also, he said we wouldn't have the conversation if there was more ISP competition. But he also said that we wouldn't really be having this conversation if the pipe were fat enough because the, whatever prioritization efforts the network operator could make would, would not really be seen by most consumers. Now, my question to you then is, um, you, you say you need to reap the rewards of some of these commercial agreements in order to continue to develop more robust networks that eventually would lead to bigger pipes. And yet, at least in your industry, you've had the capability to provide up to 10, 15 megs for a long time. And you've chosen, because you have the right to do so, to meter that bandwidth at what some would consider very high price points, but the point is you've metered that bandwidth so that you offer three for a certain level of service and then it becomes extremely expensive for individuals to order more. So how is it that you are not creating scarcity at the consumer level? I'm not a network engineer, but I'm not sure how you think we can get 15 meg off of a twisted copper pair in today's well, network architecture. I mean, we, we, our, network, our network architecture, which you know, we're looking at a 24 meg service, for example, will require significant investment to bond to copper pair to make sure that we can get the, the bandwidth necessary to support an IPTV service. But, but the idea that simply we're just throttling existing capacity is just, is just not correct. More fundamentally, again, I mean, if, if the customer, if you've got 30 million customers approximately who are still on dial up, and you have customers who are reluctant to buy one, we offer 1.5 megabits, we offer three, we offer six. Customers who are reluctant to buy that kind of capacity, why is there any reason to believe that customers are willing to pay more for 15 megabits? Uh, right now, you know, hopefully by offering value-added applications and value-added propositions, customers will want to do that. That's why we're hopeful that this is a way to get more broadband out to more places and more customers. On let's, let's go out to the audience. Um, Tim, what's our time situation? Three or four minutes. Is there someone who wants to ask a question of one of the panelists? Yes, ma'am. I have not yet heard anyone uh, touch on the international implications of this situation since Internet is a global 
network, how this may have an impact on trade and that sort of thing. I don't mean to throw a, uh, a monkey wrench in there, but that's what I'm most interested in. And if anyone can uh, comment on that. I mean, if you think about digital content being imported and exported via the, uh, the internet. Well, I, I was going to take this in a different direction, because this last answer really does show the failure of vision about what the relationship between applications and pipes. Um, we have had people across the world develop, and they're, they're now selling 8, 10, 20, 100 megabit services to their customers at much lower rates than we're paying in the U.S. And what is following that are the development of applications de developers. The, the gaming industry in Korea is astronomical. They have, uh, they have hundreds and hundreds of companies. And so what you have here is this vision that the value comes from the pipe, and now they're trying to figure out how to slowly expand the capacity of that pipe. When other people have gotten the Internet model, you deploy the pipes, and the value comes from the application. Can we, and that's why we're falling behind. One aspect of that that I think is unfair is that we have, with our fiber network, gone to a situation where we're talking 30 megs to the home now. Right. Uh, I don't, honestly, it's price, I'm sure Mark would say, too high, but it, it is out there. In some places in New York, in fact, I think it's $59 for a, a 30 meg connection. So, and then we deployed it to the past 3 million homes. We're talking about up to 20 million homes, possibly by 2009. That's what Ivan Seidenberg hopes will happen. That's what he said at CES. So we have done a pretty good effort, to, made a pretty good effort to deploy this stuff. And part of the challenge is that we're deploying it in most cases, 90% of the cases, where cable already has a network. So. We basically are deploying it, and we have to try to get the customer, which is another act of cost of acquisition and competition. And in most cases, we don't have franchise that. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts to this that make this a tough challenge. But my point is we have got vision, and we actually are making a pretty strong commitment to getting this Dan, network. Danny, do you have any response specifically to the international issue that the woman raised? Because well, we haven't really so, gotten to that. Uh, think of the ICANN discussion we had earlier. I mean, uh, uh, there's already a fair amount of international uh, unhappiness about the fact that all of the main internet uh, exchange points, the, 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 the sort of wholesale internet uh, interconnection points, are in the United States or close to the United States. Um, and I would really hate to imagine what would happen if all of a sudden the de facto operation of the U.S. interconnection points is that some packets get across those interconnection points uh, uh, on a best efforts basis, but some of them, if they've paid the right U.S. companies the right amount of money uh, uh, under the right terms, they get some special treatment. Um, I think, again, I, I don't think that's uniquely an international issue. I just think, I think it's an issue about the way the Internet works um, and, and about the obligation of every single network that connects to the Internet, whether, um, uh, whether a, a, a U.S. network or a, or a non-U.S. network. And, and I think there's a, a core uh, um, uh, uh, non-discrimination principle that, 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 that has shaped the way the Internet has always worked, and I think if, if, if the U.S. decides to, to take a step out and, and operate differently, I, I would imagine there'd be a lot of questions around the world. Uh, we're going to have time for one more question. Why that, anybody... is, why that person is coming up, can I just make a quick comment? Um, to be fair, I mean, Lank and Ben are here. Um, everything we say applies to the cable industry, and they've not really been talked about today. Um, so from our perspective, I mean, the, the, these guys are good to be here and engage in the debate, but from our perspective, everything we say also applies I, to the I cable I do think it's interesting that the cable industry has been um, rather, I think they're letting the DSL providers do the blocking and tackling here for them. Um, but that may be an editorial comment on my part. So, started this debate again. Rob. One thing that hasn't been discussed a whole lot are these quotes we keep seeing in the papers from folks like Mr. Whitaker and the gentleman from Verizon the other day saying things like Google has been getting a free lunch as if Google somehow magically gets on the Internet without paying its own connection costs which seems to be an entirely different line of argument I'm hearing, which portrays the telcos as some sort of, I guess, victim for the fact that these other companies have been able to get rich off their networks. Uh, can you sort of square what you're talking here about this, this vision of hypothetical future business models with what I'm hearing as, as a very urgent need to sort of recoup revenue that some telecom CEOs seem to feel has been stolen or leached off their networks? Well, let's first ask if you agree with the statement that companies like Google are essentially riding free on your networks. Oh, now, let me, I want to ask the telcos that question. <laughs> the network. Simple answer. I use the network. 
And I go to Google and say, and say give me this, and they send Mark, me something. So Mark, I'm the user. I, I want to know whether these two telephone, telecom companies agree with those statements. I, can, I haven't got the exact quote from Ivan, but at, at the CES show, he was very clear in saying that, even, I think he even used the word partner, but he said the broad, these folks provide content that broadband customers want to get to. So, and I recognize that. That's certainly an important thing. But they also pay for communications costs, do they not? Hundreds of millions of dollars per company get paid to the network operators on an annual basis, let, let alone driving the demand side of it. And there's no, yeah. there's no question, no from question. From a sound standpoint, that, that the Googles of the world benefit from the broadband facilities that we provide. And we certainly benefit from the services that Google provide. And I think Link or someone mentioned it's a, it's a virtuous cycle. All we're talking about is the ability to, to allow that cycle to work on a commercial basis if, in fact, two companies can get together and say, this is a good deal for us and for our customers. All right. I think that's a good stop. I want to thank all of our panelists. Please thank them and thank you for your attention. Uh, folks.